Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, sh showing up today on the webinar. Um, we appreciate you taking your time uh, to learn some more about Y-Drop and, and some of the best practices. As we look at this, uh, one of the reasons that uh, we are doing this is because we want to share what we've learned uh, ourselves or what we've heard from customers throughout the throughout the last couple of years and make sure that you don't have to go ahead and, and experience those learning curves yourself again. So as a result, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go through uh, Y drop, whether it be side dress or the SMP sprayer mount uh, types of Y drop systems and, and break it into three pieces. So uh, I'll talk about agronomically speaking. So a little reminder on why we do the things we do. And then there's some general setup tips. What are the most common frequently asked questions that we get uh, around setup or recommendations that we have for it? And then the logistics, how do we get things rolling across the field? What have we learned as we cross the field? So with that, kind of kind of talking around the agronomically speaking things. So one of the things that I always try to remember is Oftentimes we we apply our nutrients kind of backwards of, of, of what the nutrients actually may require. If we think about it, we broadcast our P and K, which are fairly immobile in the soil, and we inject our nitrogen oftentimes uh, a little ways away from the plant. We always want to keep in mind that corn effectively lives in a flower pot, and that's six to seven inches from the stalk's radius, so a 12 to 14 inch flower pot that this corn lives in that's where the majority of the roots are. And therefore that's where the majority of the uptake is happening. So if we can keep our fertilizer, you know, put our miracle Grow in the flower pot, it's gonna do a lot more uh, for us than if we put it on the sidewalk 15 inches from the marigold. So keep that in mind as we go forward. It's a, just a general thing to keep a, uh, in, in perspective that we wanna put everything in the flower pot when the plant needs it. So when corn needs it, that's when it wants nitrogen. Uh, with it, with nitrogen and sulfur's mobility, we can't necessarily preload it quite as effectively as we can with phosphorus and potassium. So if we think about Y drop in general, we have kind of a twofold uh, scenario here. One is the placement. We we are putting the drag hoses next to the plant, and we get that placement. We put it in the flower pot that the corn is is living in and we get a lot more efficient uptake. So uh, some people have asked me in the last few days, you know, how, how much efficiency do we gain with putting the nitrogen near the plant as opposed to either broadcasting it across the entire field or putting it 15 inches away with a coulter or anhydrous knife. And in general, you know, the way I look at it on, on the home farm is I plan on having about a 0.85 uh, to one ratio on nitrogen. That's that's what I plan on and then I adjust up or down depending on the conditions going into side dress season. But if I'm broadcasting it, I probably need to be closer to that 0.95 or, or 1.0 to 1 ratio. So I think and truly believe based on what I've seen in numbers that we are able to get some efficiency. We get more bang for our buck if you want to. And that's part of, that's one of the advantages to Y drop is the placement. And every year uh, that we've done trials, we see those five bushel-ish advantages to putting it next to the plant versus in the middle of the row. Now in other years, the second fold uh, advantage of, of Y drop will take place, and that's going to be the timing. So the later you can go into the corn's uh, uh, needs for nitrogen, the more knowledge you'll have of what's happened weather-wise or what you think's gonna happen going forward. So every year there's going to be a placement advantage. On some years, there's going to be a, a timing advantage. Think about 2015, we had a timing advantage. If you think about 2016, when you got into wetter soils or, or smaller root systems, you got that placement advantage. So keep that in mind. It's a two-fold system, and you can take advantage of one or both of those depending on how you're set up. So like we said, V6 corn is about, about ready to take up massive amounts of, of nitrogen. If you think about the growth curve or the uptake curve that you've seen many times out in the, out in the world, you get to V6, and it's, it's game on for nitrogen is going to be taken up. So we're going to take up eight to 10 pounds a day 
for the next three weeks. And, and so that 150 pounds, we want to make sure that we don't leave the plate empty. Sometimes we'll run into cases where people will think, okay, I've got wide drop, I've got more time. They forget about necessarily that they only put 60 pounds down and they're starting to run out of nitrogen by the time they get to V8. So always make sure you have the nitrogen in place as, as quickly as you can. One of the advantages of wide drop is the, the vast amount of time that you have to get in the field, uh, but doesn't mean you wait till the end of that time period to go out there and do it. So don't overshoot your pre application. And the other thing to keep in mind is in regarding is rates. Uh, so a lot of people ask, okay, gosh, I've been side dressing 40 gallons of, of solution uh, for, for uh, years with my coulter bar. Can I do that with wide drop? And I'll tell you that if you, if you think about it, you've got two drag hoses there. You're splitting that either side of the plant. That's effectively 20 gallons on either side of the plant. I did some last year uh, and had great success. Uh, saw a very um, non-existent leaf or root burn on those plants where we did that. So I think in reality, do I wanna go above 40 gallons? Probably not. If I need to go above 40 gallons, uh, I probably need to reconsider how much nitrogen I really, really need. Uh, because at some point in time, we're getting to the point at which we're putting excess on beyond what the corn plant needs. I think our limitation is agronomics as far as how much do we need. It's not a, a case of crop safety and it's probably not a case of pump uh, solution solution pump abilities. So a lot of times we have way more capacity to apply volume uh, with our side dress bars or our sprayers than we're ever going to realize using wide drop. Uh, part of that is because on a sprayer we are folded into 60 feet or 80 feet at the most and those pumps are meant to put out a lot of volume across the entire boom <clears throat> whether that be 90, 100, or 120 feet. So keep that in mind as we go forward that the rates are mainly limited by what the corn plant needs. So with regard to stabilizers, I always get the question on stabilizers, especially with earlier applications. Do we need them? Well, if we are at a, at a we're applying out there and there's no rain in the forecast. This year, it seems like there's rain in the forecast every third day. If there's no rain in the forecast, I'm probably going to hedge my bets and protect that nitrogen if I don't have crop canopy. So if I've got crop canopy, if I've got shade on the ground and a funnel for dew and small rains, I'm not as worried about loss of nitrogen uh, putting it next to the plant on the ground. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is with respect to stabilizers, if I'm out there at V6 or V7 corn on my early applications, I want to make sure that that plate stays full, like I said before. What I don't want to do is stabilize that nitrogen, keep half of that UAN solution in ammonia form and unavailable for the plant. I want to make sure that I don't run out of nitrate nitrogen. So not sure, um, how often you can do it, but if you were to go in very late and your crop was running low, um, the addition of a stabilizer um, may not be necessary because you want that to be available very quickly. The plant's gonna take it up, it's gonna live hand to mouth on everything it can pull out of the soil. So once you get to a point where you're, you're shaded, you're probably okay. However, if you want to have peace of mind, uh, sleep well, sleep better at night, or if the forecast is not, uh, doesn't have much moisture in it, um, stabilizers are probably a good thing. So here's, here's some general uh, setup advice as we look at, at, the, uh, at the setup of mainly from the, the base of the unit down. So uh, with, with respect to setup on, on the bar or on the sprayer, I'm gonna leave that to the instructions. Uh, what I'm looking at is basically what, how are we want to make sure that we have it set up whether re, with regard to orificing, uh, wing positioning, or even base height running across the field. Those are the three most common setup things, setup questions that we get all the time. So with regard to orificing, uh, keep in mind we're going to orifice on both sides of the split at the base. So we want to make sure that flow is even on both sides. Whether you're looking at the variable rate orifices on the on the left hand side, 
or disc orifices on the right. We still want to make sure that we're orificed on both sides. Keep in mind this other, other tip that I've learned uh, to an extent the hard way. Uh, fertilizer is not a, a crystal clear solution sometimes. Sometimes you get that load of, of 32 or, or 28 that has some, some uh, uh, foreign material in it, some salt crystals, some plastic shavings, whatever it may have been. What I do is right above the orifices where that riser hose comes down, I'll put a 50 mesh, 50 mesh tip screen in there. Uh, what that is is a last ditch effort to keep me from plugging orifices. So uh, I would uh, typically run a check valve tip screen. Uh, that what that does is it helps keep the, the the amount of solution in that riser hose from dribbling out as you go down the road or, or turn on ends. You're going to have a little bit of dribbling um, from the orifice down as that gravity cleans that out after you shut off the system. However, I want to try to keep that, that riser hose charged at all times so that it takes that much less time to start applying when I want to start applying. So a 50 mesh tip screen in there, um, very cheap investment to make sure that you don't have an orifice plug and uh, subsequently a yellow um, row going across the field. So just something I've picked up and, and generally recommend uh, they're very inexpensive and available at many places. With regard to arm positioning, so you see four pictures here with various positions being shown uh, for the wings of the Y drop. Um, these are probably guideposts uh, to start with. So in general, uh, the narrowest rows, 15s or 20s, I'm gonna be in position one. Generally speaking, if I'm in 30 inch rows and I'm in younger corn, then I'm probably leaning towards position two or position three. The shorter the corn, uh, probably the less pressure we want to put on it. And we'll go through that a bit in the side dress mount uh, conversation here in a moment. But as you can see, uh, general recommendations here, keep in mind that we have, we've incorporated flexibility into this. You know, farmers and uh, we are all, uh, destined to, to have our own opinions on how things should be set up. So if you decide that position two is what you need for 30 inch rows or position four, uh, it's all your prerogative. But in general, generally speaking, the way it was designed, uh, most of us will be running in position three and in, in larger corn. So when we look at the drag hoses on, on Y drop, this is probably something that, that I run into probably most frequently is questions about how to set up the drag hoses. That stainless fitting coming out of the wing of Y drop base, it is angled out and clocked down so that it naturally pushes that hose down towards the base of the plant. Additionally, we're using 3 8 inch hydraulic hose, which the wire meshing inside of it, that braiding creates a natural memory in that hose in which case it's always going to have a, a arc to it. So what we want to do is have that arc pointed out towards the row and pointed slightly down towards the row. So follow the natural angle of that, of that fitting coming out because what this will do is it'll help keep that tension against the plant. And when you get into smaller corn, this is where I say you might slide the wings in, uh, let the natural tension of the hose uh, be the guidepost to keep it against the side of the plant as opposed to putting more force. So it, it allows two twofold kind of pressure against the plant. You have the natural hose tension and you have the wing positioning as well. And the other, the other tip is on the hose clamp that will hold these hoses on. Always try to put that, that hose, uh, hose clamp to where the, the, I guess the nut on the clamp is facing inward and kind of uh, closer to the middle of the row. What we want to do is make sure that we don't fill that that uh, that screw with with debris uh, going through the field, so it's easy easy to manage going forward. And also, it protects it from hitting up against uh, leaves and such like that. It shields it so that we don't get any potential crop damage due to mechanical interaction. So this is kind of where we're we're going to get into the side dress 
type of conversation. So 360 Y-Drop has two applications, one on side dress bars, as you can see, the other on sprayers. I want to kind of focus on the side dress side of the world for a moment. There's a lot of side dress bars out there in the marketplace that were purchased, you know, five to seven years ago. And as time has gone on, the coulters are wearing down, the knives are wearing down, all the wear, the bearings are starting to get some age to them. And so some of the wear parts are getting to the point where, where they're going to have to have some major updating. And that's when the, the opportune time is to convert to 360 wide drop. Um, let's think about the timing. You know, so, so typically what we've seen is a lot of side dressing with a coulter rig happens when corn is very short. So about four days after you get done planting soybeans, people decide that, hey, now is a great time to get started on side dressing because we are afraid that we're not going to get it done. So as you look at that bottom left-hand picture, you've got V2 corn uh, at, on a good day, that's V2 corn. There has not been very much nitrogen taken up by that plant. And, and as a result of that, it's it's plenty happy living on what you've applied either with the planter or broadcast with your weed and feed. You really don't need to need to add more nitrogen at that point in time. You don't have very much more information than you had April 25th when you planted that field. While you can go out there and if you're in that early of corn, you're going to have to go very slow because those hoses are going to drag over the top of that little corn plant. Ideally, we're probably waiting until I'm going to call it boot high corn. So we're going to we're going to go out there when corn's about six to eight inches tall at a minimum, and that's when we're going to start. We've transitioned to that nodal root system. We're beyond V3 corn, and now we're having some nodal roots come out. We're starting to live off the soil, and so now is a great time to start feeding that plant as as it goes forward in its life. So getting out there, we've got time. You know, we can go out there anywhere from, say, boot high up until uh, probably uh, close to thigh high corn with a side dress bar. So we've got still got a lot of window. And one of the things to keep in mind is because we're not dragging a coulter or a ground engaging component through the soil, if it rains a half an inch, all we have to do is wait for it to, to dry enough to cross the field. We don't have to engage the soil. So if you could spray, you could side dress. Something to keep in mind, uh, a differentiator to buy back another day or two in that side dress window. Uh, so running the gauge, gauge wheels in the highest position. So what we want to do, we want to elevate that bar as much as possible to make sure that we have the crop clearance that we have, uh, that we can get the most out of it. But all things considered, your tractor height is going to be the limitation. So that draw bar height is going to be the the limitation and so if you have a choice between a, a tractor that's sitting on 42 inch rubber or one that's on 50s lean towards the taller tractor it'll gain you another you know four inches of crop clearance and per perhaps another couple three days of ability to go out there so think about those things as you go forward chances are your bar is not the lowest point it's going to be your hitch hitch positioning and the the front end of your tractor so we're going to we're going to run the wings on on wide drop side dress probably you know i showed the four pictures a little bit ago and position 3 was the recommendation for 30 inch rows and that is the recommendation for 30 inch rows on a on an smp or a sprayer mount type of system if I'm looking at earlier side dress, that boot high, I'm probably running them in position two. I want to take a little bit of pressure, positive pressure off with the wings, let the drag hoses, as you can see, they cross in this picture laying on the floor. That drag hose is going to be right up against that young corn plant and be enough pressure to keep it in place and, and keep it going. In general, with wide drop side dress, my base height that I'm going to run is about eight inches. So keep that in mind, your, your base height off the ground is going to be about 8 to 10 inches. That riser is adjustable depending on your gauge wheel uh, adjustability. Some are extendable, you know, to get, get quite a bit of movement out of them, and some are, are relatively fixed in how they're, how they're going to sit in the field. At the end of the day, we, we, want, we know that on a side dress bar, we have gauge wheels, and the height is not as big of a deal. Uh, we can manage an 8-inch height a 10 inch height very effectively 
we do have the breakaway built into the system so that if you go through a waterway or there is a terrace or something and one touches down it's going to break back and reset itself as soon as uh, as soon as you clear that obstruction so keep that in mind um, try to run them in that eight to ten inch range and uh, and that way the and keep the hoses kind of towards the middle a little bit more and we'll we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to keep those hoses right uh, right at the point we need them so let's talk a little bit more about sprayer mounted systems or SMP sprayer mount package based systems and what you can and cannot do with them so if I look at it at going across flat ground and a lot of the pictures that you see sometimes are, are in flat ground like this one um, breakaways don't seem like they need to are, are a necessity but if I think about breakaways uh, they're going to do two things for me uh, whether whether you you're in flat ground or hills you're going to have rocking back and forth to your sprayer boom to some extent and as a result of that managing those wings that are either 30 feet from you sitting in the seat or 40 feet from you sitting in the seat managing those wing heights to, to 12 inches which is generally the starting point where we want to be on on sprayer mount systems is going to be pretty difficult and occasionally they are going to touch down so having breakaways on the outside four or six rows for certain is going to be very helpful um, because those ends are going to touch down you're going to end up uh, potentially um, doing some damage to the riser or the riser mount if you don't have them uh, first year i ran y drop didn't have them i bent a few riser mounts um, messed up a couple of risers at the end of the day, it's cheaper to put in the breakaway and protect the system from, from yourself than it is to, um, to, to not have it. So I, my recommendation, I have them all the way across my system. I would at least put them on the outside four to six rows. The other advantage, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is it gets you a four inch setback from that SMP, from that mounting point on the sprayer. And this can be advantageous when you get into um, transport modes and and getting yourself some more clearance away from away from the wheels so as we talk about we talked a lot about height off of uh, a side dress bar and we want to be in that eight to, eight to ten inch range if we think about a sprayer system I probably want to be a little bit taller off the ground uh, I'm generally speaking not out there in boot high corn as, as frequently because I have a larger window on the back side to get out there. I'm probably out there more in that V6 and beyond, so kind of um, close to knee high and beyond type of, uh, type of corn. What we want to end up with is about four to six inches of the drag hose dragging on the ground. And what this does is that amount of hose will naturally keep it at the row. If we run the bases too low to the ground, so if we uh, get some more speed, we're running eight to 10 miles an hour, 12 miles an hour with a sprayer versus maybe six to eight or nine or 10 at the very most with a side dress bar, it, with more speed and more hose on the ground, that hose will drag towards the center of the row and you'll lose some of that placement efficiency if you have the have the base too low to the ground. So always keep the base around a foot off the ground if possible. And as you get into taller corn, less is more. Uh, so less hose is more efficient at keeping that, or less hose on the ground is more efficient at keeping that hose right where it needs to be. So as you get into taller corn, waist high corn and beyond, it's all right to let that come up to 16 inches. You're, you're better off to have that. It will drag the hose uh, last couple of inches down at the base of the plant and as avoid it flopping around towards the middle of the row. A uh, little background video for you to watch as I talk through these points right here. One that I recorded last summer. And, and one of the things that I you'll notice in some of the YouTube videos that I I record is I'll I'll put something in the background that uh, will be a, a caveat or a, a, an extra little little thing to watch and you see in the background on on this video right now is height control uh, right now height control we're still working on options for that uh, I kind of took options into my own hands and and moved my sonar sensors 
down onto a riser out in front of the Y drop. As you can see through there, the Y drop bases in the background are dangling a little bit relative to the one in the front. So the one in the front, I want to keep independent because if, if I do touch down and that Y drop base goes back, then that, that sonar doesn't think the ground is farther away. So the other thing you see right here is as I'm turning, you see that I gull wing that, that wing. So the outer wing, I am not gull wing. The one that's going forward, even though it's going forward fast, I'm not, not raising up. But that inside one that goes backwards, I wanna make sure that I raise that up just a little bit. It doesn't have to clear the canopy, but what it has to do is get up to the flexible part of the plant so that you don't break it off going backwards. And then once again, I hit my resume button on sonar and race across the field uh, with height control. I did run this in some, some very rolling hills, nothing you know terribly aggressive uh, as far as hill wise, but it did uh, handle waterways very well. Uh, sonar is not perfect. Uh, you, you need to have some shielding to keep, keep the leaves from getting between the sensor and, and the ground. Uh, and then also occasionally it would, it would go funny and, and, and one side or the other would, would get a little bit out of whack and, and touch down. But you just keep an eye on it rather than have to manage it all the time. It does help a lot that way. So some of the things I learned uh, as, you, as you do it, uh, an extension harness or an extension cord from where the sonar plugs in on the boom down towards the, the top of the bucket, as you can see that I've done. Um, the bucket shields the the sonar beam from the ground and and height control is 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 way better than it is with me manually doing it. Front mount booms probably not as necessary. Front mount booms you can see uh, and and therefore um, you can get away with it without uh, without having some height control. Rear mount booms this is this is something to try until a better solution presents itself. One other thing that I want to kind of talk about, an additional thing, is setbacks around the wheels. So you can see in this picture these setbacks that I constructed on, on my sprayer uh, before last season. And the reason is here. If you look at this picture on the right, when I would turn the wheels of my sprayer, uh, it was a 4930, that fender and the lugs would get into the Y drop bases. And you can see that those three risers uh, up here, these three that are surrounding the wheels. So you'll always have one at the front edge of the wheel, one at the hub, and one at the back. Those are set back, and they're set back about 10 inches um, in reality. You'll see that this bar and this bar, the setback is six inches, as you can see on the bottom left hand picture. And then you have the breakaway, which is going to set it back an additional four inches. So 10 inches got me clear of my my fender on my on my wheels. And therefore, when I got done with the field, all I did was fold and travel down the road. It does make you a little bit wider going down the road. If you're in an area where it doesn't matter, then it doesn't matter. If you're in an area with uh, tight traffic, um, it's your discretion how you want to handle this, how you want to balance width for, for transport and, and ease versus width to go down the road and meet traffic. So. Something to something to look into. Basically, here's the parts that I use to put this together. It's it's a fairly simple um, system way to do it. You slide out two extension tubes on each side, put a longer one in, and build that little sub uh, boom. Uh, so, anyone that has any questions can feel free to contact anyone of us here at 360, and we'll we'll put you in in uh, in the driver's seat and and not make you get out if it, if that works out for you. As we look at setting up sprayers uh, for Y drop, probably the thing that I've watched get overlooked the most is setting up spray sections. So especially this year going forward, the 47s and 4830s uh, and the 4930s and 40s, uh, the John Deere sprayers are only gonna have three drops in the middle section. So one of the things that we wanna do is make sure that we've allocated the right number of feet to the right number uh, to the correct section. So we always want to make sure and go into our setup, whether you're in a 2630 as I am here, or Trimble or, or Ag Leader or whatever, make sure those sections are set to the appropriate width. Uh, as you're going across the field, 
you know, obviously on, on most of them, you're going to be 60 feet wide. And that 60 feet is not going to change going across the field. But when you get to headland control, if you have these numbers drastically off, most sprayers are at least 10 feet wide on, on their center section and subsequently uh, smaller on the wings uh, or, or bigger on the wings. We're not going to be 10 feet wide in that center section. We're going to have to add some to the outside, subtract some from the middle. Make sure it's appropriate so that your rate stays uh, the, the rate that it needs to be given the sections that are turned on. The other thing I would look at, uh, your, your offsets, if you're using section control, um, you'll want to make sure those offsets are appropriate. If you look at that distance C from, from the back of the sprayer to the, to the outlet location of the boom, we are going to be back of that. On a John Deere, generally speaking, it's about four feet further back uh, from in, in that point in that C. So that 86.1 inches, I'm going to add 48 onto that is what I did myself to get to the discharge portion of that wide drop base. At the end of the hose, that's where it's going to be. And so what we don't want to do is end up with uh, it turning on too fast or more importantly, shutting off too soon. And therefore we end up with uh, some some yellow corn, you know, 60 foot blocks that have uh, shorted, been shorted uh, side dress nitrogen. So these are some of the things that, that we've we've noticed as we've gone through time and just want to make sure that that you have all the information that we have. If there are additional things that that you uh, have learned or, or have questions about, like I said, feel free to get a hold of us and, and we'll try to get any all the information we have and come up with answers for things that we haven't run into yet. So with that, uh, we really appreciate your, your time and uh, attention this morning. And by all means, and it's going to get very hectic over the next few weeks. We want everyone to stay safe. Take your time. It'll take a lot less time to do things well, do things safely than it will to either have to redo something or more importantly, if you or, or a loved one gets hurt along the way. So be safe and uh, we'll see you soon.